Welcome to the herd and thanks for listening. If you enjoy this sodcast, please like it, share it, give it a good rating and follow and help more people find their way into the Ruminati herd. If you have suggestions for improvements, please let me know. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Meet Your Herdmates Sodcast. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Dr., if you will, Pedro <laughs> Nunes, uh, who's joining us from the state of Rio Grande del Sul in Brazil. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here talking with you. I've seen you've invited a lot of important people, uh, some names that I, I follow in the social medias, uh, a lot of experts, and I feel honored to be here talking with you. Well, uh, first of all, congratulations on your recent degree completion. And um, as Dr. Fetke said, who's next? Uh, we, 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 we old farts need to be thinking about <laughs> who's next. And I certainly think you're one of the people up and coming scientist and, and worker in the really important field of the integration of livestock and cropping systems. So it's in, entirely my pleasure. Uh, I'm grateful that we got to meet at a little event not too long ago. Um, yeah, 2018. That seems like a lot longer ago than just two and a half years or yeah, whatever it was. This is true. Yeah, has anything happened? Um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot happened. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? What were circumstances? What do you do now? How did you get into this? <clears throat> okay. Uh, first of all, uh, well, you said this before, my name is Pedro, or in, in good Brazilian Portuguese, Pedro. Uh, my background is uh, agronomy. Uh, I went to, to the agronomy school, uh, but I decided to, to specialize in animal science. Um, so I have a master's degree in animal science and also a PhD in animal science, which was recently earned, as you said. Um, and, and all this, this, this time I was in the academia, I, I've been focusing on grazing systems or, or the grazing process itself. Um, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher uh, at the Grazing Ecology Research Group uh, here in, in, in Rio Grande do Sul, uh, which is led by Dr. Paulo Carvalho. And, and, and which is the same group uh, I've been working and uh, I did all my graduate studies. Uh, so as I said before, we studied the, we studied the grazing process and the effects of grazing in, in all sorts of grassland ecosystems from, from native to cultivated grasslands. Uh, and in the later case, uh, including, including the integrated crop livestock systems which is the subject where I, I specialized the most uh, in the in recent years. Is, this is the topic of my PhD uh, dissertation. And, and this, these studies include things like forage and, and, and animal pr productivity uh, as affected by different grazing intensities um, or methane mitigation through pasture management uh, or the effect of grazing and grazing intensity on soil characteristics um, and, and a lot of things more profitability of the systems, the stability of the systems uh, over time. So um, as you said before, I live in the southernmost state of Brazil, which translating would call the big river of the south for those who, who doesn't know Portuguese. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a quite different place in Brazil in comparison to the rest of, of Brazil. Um, I, I usually say that um, our environment, our, our culture, and, and our people are more alike people from, uh, from Uruguay and Argentina because of, 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 of basically because of our culture here. Uh, here we have the Pampa biome or the Pampa grasslands, 
which is uh, the smallest biome in, in Brazil, uh, but extends over, over, I think, entire, the entire country of Uruguay, part of, of, of Argentina, and, and a little part of, of Paraguay. People also call this region the, the Rio de la Plata grasslands. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and I come from a place like this. Uh, I come from a family uh, who owns a, a, a farm, a piece of land uh, right in the middle of the Pampa Bayon. So this is the reason why I got uh, interested in, in animal sciences uh, at the first place. Uh, so I think this is my, this, uh, I can say this is my background. This is why I'm here. This is why we met in 2018 in the, in the second Brazilian conference on crop livestock integration. Mm. That's yes. right. Am I yes. right, Peter? Yes, you are. And so mm. are you the, f are, have others in your family gotten to go to university or? Um... Yeah, they all went to the university. Uh, uh, they all have uh, a, a superior degree, but uh, only one. I have one uncle who is a biologist and, and a doctor in entomology. So he studies uh, insects and is a professor in, in, in another state uh, mm -hmm. to the north in Rio de Janeiro. I think everybody knows Rio de Janeiro. So, but, but he's the only doctor in the family. And now I'm the, the second one. I have the, 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 the honor to say I'm the second doctor in the family. But I have uh, another uncle who is a veterinary, and he's the one, he's the manager of, the, of our family farm. Uh, so these, these two guys are, are the ones uh, on which I, inspi I inspired myself in, in the beginning of my trajectory, I think. <laughs> um, but the farm you grew up on was a mixed farm. It was cropping and livestock. Not actually. Not actually. Uh, it's it's a it's a livestock farm. Uh, the majority of it is is composed by native native grasslands, almost on perfect state uh, state of conservation. Uh, with some parts are in some parts we grow uh, cultivated annual pastures. And in, in, in another small parts, we have a little of agriculture, um, but these lands we rent to, 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 to our neighbors. So the family works only with, specifically with livestock. But the region, uh, my, my, the region around uh, our farm is, is very, um, how can I say, uh, croplands are, are very present in the region. Uh, it's it's one of the main grain producers, one of the main soybean producers in our state, my my city, the city where where I'm, I'm I was born. So so, hmm. agriculture and croplands are are, are are surrounding and 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 expanding more and more. It's 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 a challenge to to keep the system untouched and and the native grasslands untouched and conserved. It, it is, of course, a pattern globally that crop uh, the grasslands globally have been in many parts of the world largely, if not entirely, converted into crop agriculture. Um, and yeah. the same thing is happening in Brazil and, and to an extent that I think we hear very much about deforestation and uh, Amazonia, but we don't hear so much about the other grassland regions of of brazil yeah this is true i think most people worldwide uh, uh, hear about the amazon which is which is an important concern and and they everybody must hear about it and 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 concern about it but uh here in the south uh, as i said we have the pampa biome which is in size, I think it's the, the, the small, maybe the smallest biome in Brazil. Uh, and maybe this is why people don't, don't, don't listen about the Pampa biome this much. But uh, in terms of conversion or suppression for any given reason, 
this was the biome that in the last in the recent decades was suppressed the most uh, and I think uh, something around 40 percent of the pampa is is remaining and the rest was totally suppressed uh, uh, mostly by soybean expansion and some part uh, by um, silviculture uh, ex uh, expansion, mainly eucalyptus. So it, it, it is a concern because it's, it's, it's an extremely rich ecosystem, uh, hundreds of, of native plant species and hundreds of animal species that depend and rely on this habitat. Uh, hundreds of, ma of birds, uh, mammals, reptiles, a lot of insects, and, and there it goes. So we must uh, concern about the pampas too. And, and the soil as well. Um, certainly where we first met, we were in Mato Grosso, and those highly weathered soils were... Um, but one of the reasons for these integrated systems was to keep those soils covered and protected and to try to maintain organic matter. Yeah. Um, so that was that was one thing to come back. But before we go completely away from the grassland conversion, there's another biome that's larger than Pampa, but it would be a little bit further north, so more tropical, and that would be Cerrado. Is that correct? The Cerrado. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's it's and, it's it's larger than the Pampa. I don't have the, I don't have the numbers in my in my mind right now, but it's larger and it 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 suffered a lot with uh, cropland expansion and also the expansion of other perennial pastures, cultivated pastures. I think. Most of this biome is cultivated today with croplands and uh, pasture species like the brachiarias. And sometimes uh, they are not, uh, best management practices are not used. And that's why uh, people try to, to recover these areas using uh, systems like the integrated crop livestock systems, uh, because overgra overgrazing is a concern as well as, as the conversion of these uh, ecosystems, overgrazing is, is present in, in, in all these ecosystems, uh, in Cerrado, in, in the Pampas. So th th we have a lot, a lot to, to learn about how to manage these ecosystems and, and treat them properly, how, how they deserve. This is a global truth. This is mm -hmm. not specific to Brazil. It, it's everywhere you go that except Antarctica, I think you can see um, the need for improved grass management, forage management, and then this integration. So to the, you explained to me um, when we met way back in 2018, um, that they were basically launching like the third form of system that they had started with a very simple system. And, and, and per, if you still remember that, that's fine. If not, we can talk I can, about- I can, try, I can try to remember if you help me. Sure, happy to. Um, we, the, the last event that we went to, we traveled out to a, an operation. And, and mm -hmm. what was striking, first of all, was the pastures that we drove by with very mm -hmm. little grass. And then we got to this place, which was still in the same region. It was a neighboring property and they had beautiful grass stands, um, but they were also in rotation with the- With beans, uh, beans. I guess. I, And I think there was some cowpea in the forage mixture. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and a couple bracky area. It wasn't just a single grass. Yeah, they, they, they had three, three species of brachiaras, I think. Or maybe one of them was not a brachiaria, it was a panicum. Mm. Uh, and, and it was a consortium with uh, cowpea. Yeah, this is, this is right. And they were trying to find which was the, the best mixture to in terms of of improving the increasing the live weight gains of of cattle in that place 
And of course, I don't remember which was the, the, the best one, mm -hmm. but uh, I've heard they, are, they, already, um, they already got some pretty interesting results in terms of uh, microbial improvements uh, and, and, and pasture uh, soil quality improvements uh, in that system. And it's a, it's, a, it's a recent system. It's not a, it's not a long-term system. They started back in 2000, I think back in 2018 or 17. And they already have improvements, uh, important improvements in soil quality. So maybe this is one way to, to, to recover these degraded pasturelands. Yes. Um, and it was probably before um, I got to the conference, but I remember seeing that there were systems of growing soybeans, which there would have been planted in, say, September, harvested in like January. Mm -hmm. In February, corn would have been planted no-till into the stubble of the soybeans. Um, and, and I think Bracky area was actually seeded at the same time, I think. Mm -hmm. And then come June or July, the corn would have been harvested. And then the mm -hmm. Bracky area. So when we saw it, there was still the, the corn was nearing the end of its um, cycle. But along the edges of the field, the Bracky area would have gotten enough sunlight to really be growing inside, not so much. And then once the corn is harvested, then the Bracky area is released and grows. Mm -hmm. And basically it grows until September when they mm -hmm. go in again and do no-till soybeans. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was sort of a first stage of this kind of process. And of course I was looking at it going, can't you graze that? You're, um, but but then people told me that there needed to be a certain amount of dry matter on the surface or the organic or the organic matter levels of the soils actually decline because of weather and temperature and the nature of the soils. Yeah. They they were probably trying to improve the 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 content of organic matter and to to recover a little that degraded land before they, they started grazing. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, if they started grazing before, um, I, I don't think it would be a problem uh, since uh, as long as adequate, uh, and when I say adequate, usually I say moderate grazing intensities uh, or moderate stocking rates were, were used. Uh, I don't think they would degrade more the land. They would start already improving the quality of that soil and that land but i think it was an option they, they decided to go to the most the safest way before they started grazing and peter well, I, I think may, maybe it's important it's important to 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 say to those who don't know what we are talking about integrated crop livestock system but th this is one kind of integration uh with intercropping as you said brachiaria was already growing uh, within the rows of of maize, uh, we don't have, for for instance, this kind of system, uh, or 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 at least it's not that usual here in this in the south. Here we have more kind of a crop pasture yearly rotation. So we have, uh, let's say, soybean in the summer, and then it uh, the soybeans are succeeded by by a winter annual pasture. And then soybean comes, or or maize comes. Uh, it depends on the degree of diversification that the system has. But the, the, the combinations, um, the combina the possible combinations of of crops and animals is 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 uh, as large as, as as the number of of species of plants and animal species that that are being cultivated uh, in this in these places. For instance. Uh, in California, where I've been, where, where I, I did part of my PhD, they were starting with, uh, they, they, they are starting to improve the usage of, of, of vineyards uh, with sheep grazing, sheep grazing uh, uh, the understory vegetation of vineyards. 
Mm -hmm. So there are several combinations, several possible combinations uh, to, to, to compose uh, an integrated crop livestock system. The important thing is to, to plan the system and not just uh, throw the animals and the crops there. It must have, we must have a planning, trying and, and knowing that what we want is to um, use the synergies among the system components and, and, and improve the, the whole system performance and not, not only looking, for instance, no, I, I, want to, I want to my soybeans to produce the most and then I have the pasture uh, in the sequence and I, I will grow some cattle, I will raise some cattle there. No, the intention is to look to the system and to, to, to improve the whole system functioning, efficiency and productivity. Mm -hmm. And in, in uh, so one thing that we're seeing in North America is a lot of cover crop as a concept, which is similar to what we were talking about. It's it's introducing either before or after harvest a new group of annual uh, plants mm -hmm. and. The goal is to keep the soil covered, to keep growing plants on and in that soil for as long as the growing season permits in that area. And then there, are, so there are people who do that solely within a cropping system. They they have no livestock. Mm -hmm. And then there are others who utilize that material as forage for grazing livestock as well. So now we're, as you said, not just integrating the cropping systems on the same piece of ground, but we're integrating livestock into those cropping systems at points of the year. Um, so we, we've gone through a period in America where our agriculture became more and more specialized. Uh, where it used to be much mixed farming, livestock and cropping was the norm, with a lot of different things being grown. And we've gone through a period of specialization where you grow fewer crops, bigger scale, and in many cases, you've gotten out of livestock farming and focus only, or vice versa. Um, um, and we're seeing a move toward that reintegration. So there was another system that I saw, which you mentioned silvopastoral agriculture. So the idea that we could have a trees being some, some sort of tree crop being grown, which in Mato Grosso might take 20 years to come to maturity because they're a tropical region. Um, but in between, in the wide spaces in between, you could grow grass for a period and graze it, and then in rotation grow soybeans or some other crop. Um, and so now you've got these three enterprises. Um, and, and so is, is that something that you've worked on or is it just something that occurs in other parts of, of Brazil? Actually, I'm I, I'm not used to I didn't work with this yet I never did research in these systems but I I've seen I've I've read research on this and some maybe two weeks ago I was I was uh, watching to a an online field day and there was a, a farmer talking about his system and 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 he used this kind of system configuration with trees, which is another pretty interesting system because um, if you use the right uh, distance between three rows, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't compromise uh, any, uh, any aspect of your system. They don't compromise uh, the crop productivities, crop yields, they don't compromise forage yields, uh, also, uh, uh, they can be considered, uh, of course, they take some time to, to be harvested, but meanwhile, they are providing uh, shade or mm -hmm. shadow. Yeah. 
They're mm-hmm. providing shade for, for the animals. And when they, once they are harvested, they provide a lot of cash. So they are, they are a reserve of cash in the property. Mm-hmm. And it becomes even more interesting if you're using native species. Uh, a lot of people use eucalyptus because of the, 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 how fast it grows. And, 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 uh, but native species would be also an, an, an interesting option uh, of trees. And everything so, goes towards the diversification of the system. I think uh, the more diversified the system is, the more interesting it becomes in terms of, of synergies and, and, and ecosystem functioning. It, it, it's mimicking the nature. And again, little appreciated. There's, there, there's, there's, the, there's the perception that it's either livestock agriculture or it's crop agriculture producing human edible crops. And what this points to is no livestock and crop agriculture are integrated everywhere in some places intimately on the same operation on the same fields. In other parts, say in North America, they're still integrated, but they may be separate operations where um, you've got byproducts produced from the processing of one plant source food go into livestock agriculture somewhere else. So in California, my joke is that you can't, you really can't get milk from almonds, but you can get them from almond hulls, which are fed to the dairy cattle in California. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah this is true and of course um, uh, they can be these integrated systems they can occur at across various spatial temporal scales as as we said before but uh, we must take into account that the more close these components are the more intense and 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 dynamic the, the flows will be like the nutrient flows and as well as the synergies, the emergent properties, as people are saying. Uh, so this is a thing, a thing to, to think about. And we, if, if we look at the past, at the beginning of agriculture and animal domestication, uh, the systems were mixed. The systems were integrated, aiming to... to, to um, I lost the word, but to enjoy these synergies, to, yeah, to use, yeah, exploit yeah. These, these synergies. And uh, at some point, uh, mainly after industrialization, people starting to specialize uh, and, and, and they never stopped. And now, yeah. as we need to produce more food in the same area of land and, and uh, preferably using less input, because the environment can't, can't handle more impact. Uh, people are starting to look uh, to crop livestock integration with, with good eyes and as a, as a way to, to follow. And research is showing that uh, they don't have to, they don't need to concern about the impact of, of the animals on, on subsequent uh, crop productivities. Because th- this is the main concern and and this is the main reason, the main barrier, uh, why f- farmers uh, concern about crop livestock integration. They are afraid of, for instance, the hoof action of the animals would uh, cause soil compaction, and this would compromise the subsequent soybean yield. This is only one example. And they probably have a reason to, to, to think this way, because uh, somewhere in the past, some someone uh, did this crop livestock integration, but not using best management practices and uh, maybe not using no-till, using conventional tillage practices, uh, using heavy stocking rates. And the result was exactly this one. The, 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 the crop productivities uh, were compromised. But uh, we are showing more and more... Uh, uh, each study that we publish, we, we 
we show that they don't have reasons to concern and generally uh, the subsequent crop yields are not affected by 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 livestock if adequate uh, grazing intensities are used and and there was just recently a paper just very recently looking at the fertilizer inputs into a cropping livestock system and suggesting it would be better use to put it on the pasture. Yeah, this and, is and, the, yeah. This is another talk. barrier. This is another barrier to 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 overcome. Uh, we call this system fertilization. And and the reason why we call system fertilization is because you're fertilizing the whole system and the whole land instead of fertilizing only the 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 crop. Uh, and in that case, I think it was the soybean crop. Uh, this is a paper from, from a friend of mine. He is currently a doctoral student in, in, in our group. Uh, and he showed that, that the, the whole system efficiency improves nutrient use efficiency and productivities. They, they increase if you use the system fertilization uh, strategy. Because in the conventional crop fertilization strategy, you're focusing on the grain crop so you apply the fertilizer uh, immediately before soybean cropping. And once you harvest the soybeans, what happens? All the nutrient is exported. And then in the sequence, you have a pasture which is lacking nutrients. And so it produces less. Uh, consequently, you produce less meat. And then the system uh, repeats uh, annually. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in the system fertilization approach, this doesn't happen because you apply all the fertilizers uh, in the winter, in the pasture phase. The animals basically recycle the nutrients. A tiny portion of the nutrients is are, are exported, and then you come with the with the soybean without any fertilizer, and it produces the same. So you produce more pasture, more beef, and the same soybean per, uh, yields. So the, and using the same amount of the same amount of, of input. input. So this this is the kind of thing we must pursue uh, towards sustainable, more sustainable uh, agricultural systems or agricultural systems of the future. This is so, a good example. A, a, uh, as you said, m more food produced from the same unit of land from a lower input, yeah, which is, is just win-win-win. Yeah, um, and probably sequestering more carbon because you have more oh, forage yeah. growth and, yeah. and more root growth and yeah. more carbon input. So yeah, the, everything, win-win-win. The, 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 the root structure of Lolia multiflorum versus um, Glycine Max is completely different. Um, yeah. and, and even with the uh, nitrogen fixation that soybeans can do, um, you could have winter legumes doing a similar sort of thing in the annual legumes in, in, in the pasture phase of that system. So, um, uh, and, and, and sometimes, sometimes, uh, uh, we think soybeans are producing all the nitrogen they, 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 they need, yeah. but they're actually using some nitrogen from the soil. Uh, this is a, a recent result from a recent paper, which was published uh, by our group uh, with another group uh, uh, here in the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, showing that part of the nitrogen used by the soybeans comes from soil solution. So we're relying too much on nitrogen produced by soybeans. Yeah. The, there are... It's one of those um, pieces of received wisdom that when we actually look at it, we go, eh, maybe not. Um, yeah. You know, so you, the work that's being published, uh, people who don't aren't so fortunate as to read and speak Portuguese, um, assuming that this is published in English, there are places that they, where would you recommend people go to, Kind of learn more and and stay current. One of the places that I, that they could search for these these pieces of, of science is 
uh, it's more informal, but it's it's. I'm always sharing researches from our group and also from from other groups uh, that I that I follow and that I I find they produce important science and relevant science. Uh, this place is my Twitter, uh, which is Pedro A. A. Nunes, uh, but they can just find find my Twitter on on your account. Uh, uh, we follow each other on Twitter, and there they would find my research gate. Mm-hmm. We have, I have lots of papers, uh, lots of papers. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I have some papers there, which I published recently. You're doing very well. So, <laughs> but yes, some papers, maybe maybe something around ten papers there, and and and. But they, if they find this link, they will be. They, they will find uh, the, uh, another links from my advisor, for instance, which, and, and this, uh, this one, this guy has a lot of, of, of papers, some, some hundreds of papers uh, about grazing management and, and all of these things we've been talking here. Yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll be sure to put links in show notes so that people can find these. Because um, I think it's really important for people to become aware of the work that has been done and is being done, um, because often people just aren't aware of these subjects. And so why mm-hmm. would they know about it? Um, so one of, one of the keys for, okay, there's another point. It strikes me that a lot of the story about the conversion of land because of beef is ignoring the fact that, and this is my perception, so correct me if I'm wrong, that that pasture phase is in fact a phase of the conversion process going from native vegetation to soybeans that that the, they they run cattle on that land for a period of time while they continue to try to clear it and fit it for agricultural production of of crop is that i fair? think i think i think this 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 is a process that happens uh more, more frequently in the north in 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 areas like amazon uh uh at least this is what i I hear. I, I personally don't know the Amazon, and I, I've never been there to and talked what? with. A, what with, you with... haven't been everywhere in Brazil? <laughs> no, uh, I mean it's Brazil, just Brazil. <laughs> it's a little, it's a little far away from here. But I should have known already the Amazon. It's it's it must be an an, an amazing place. So so since I, I never talked with local ranchers or local soybean growers, I can't. Um, Sure, with 100% certainty that this is what's happening there. But this is what I hear, or I listen. Uh, but here, here in the south, uh, the case of conversion of pampa grasslands, usually, uh, sometimes what happens, and in this case, is some. Uh, sometimes I can understand when when the rancher needs to convert a little piece of land to compose the whole system and for in, in a strategic way to improve productivity, like, uh, like for finishing, uh, finishing steers in the winter. So it converts a little piece of land in, in an annual pasture, which is more productive and it will produce more beef in that place. But mostly this, the, the, this conversion, which is uh, suppressing the majority of the pampa grasslands is driven by by the expansion of croplands no doubt mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. The, the, and and the, i think i think i remember somebody saying again from Mato Grosso that what was happening was there had been a lot of pastures that had been converted into cropland and then that kind of displaced animals so marginal lands yeah and and that gets me to the point where a lot of a lot of what we think about forage agriculture comes to us because it's been practiced on the more marginal to less productive land and managed in a way that is marginal 
or certainly not as with the 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 focus that happens in the cash crops mm -hmm. um and therefore people think about it as only returning you know mm -hmm. to that degree well if we managed it differently maybe we'd have different returns perfect um, yeah this is uh, i like the way you 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 put it like they were first displaced to marginal lands and for some reasons maybe for this reason they are treated like a marginal a marginal component Enterprise. Mm -hmm. of enterprise of the system but this is this is a this is a mistake why would somebody manage a cropland with soil analysis with the adequate levels of fertilizer aiming to to, to exploit and and have the, the the best efficiency of that land and then do not uh, why why this person doesn't do the same with the the pasture land yeah. well we doesn't we, make sense in the states at least and you can tell me gaucho culture what um that we have cowboys and we have farmers and we have people that the the mine it doesn't always translate and if you have if you have those people working together in an operation, that's fine. Um, but one of the challenges has been getting people to think of themselves as grass farmers, not cattlemen. Perfect. We, know, we, the, you, we have a very similar uh, word for this, uh, which I, uh, there's no, uh, in, I, I don't know if I should say this in Portuguese, but uh, a cropland is a lavoura. A lavoura de grãos is a cropland, and here we say that we should manage the pasture lands as a lavoura de carne, which is a crop of, um, as you said, a grass crop. Grass. grass a, yeah, we're grass, grass farmers. Crop. Grass, grass farmers. farmers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they both croplands and pasture lands should they should both be managed with the same degree of attention and and understanding and not just re relied as a, as a marginal thing a marginal component of the enterprise mm -hmm. so um a couple more questions one is what what do you think are the the keys and challenges to sustainable and that includes profitable um beef systems in uh, just stay in your part of of brazil i think we could summarize this in may maybe two words uh, one would be to, to to this this is not one word but okay uh, to overcome the barriers so barriers the barriers mm -hmm. barriers, barriers. Mm -hmm. to overcome these barriers uh, such as, as I said before, uh, this concern about uh, compromising the, the, the crops using livestock in, in, in the previous season. Uh, so listening to the, to the science, listening to, to the scientists who are working and studying uh, these systems and showing the, uh, which are the ways to manage these systems and and, and showing that there is no reason to concern as long as the best management practices are, are used. Uh, and the second word uh, I've just said is management. I think uh, managing the systems properly uh, would, 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 would help uh, improving the, the, the sustainability and the profitability of, of these systems. Mo, uh, we, we see down here, down here in the South Brazil, in South Brazil, a lot of farmers with that idea that improving the, effic the efficiency of, of, of uh, 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 grassland system is to eat everything you have above ground. So the more homo homogenous is the, is the system, the more homogenous is the pasture, the, the, the better it is. And this is just not true. Uh, nature is not homogenous. So to have uh, heterogeneity is, is desirable in, in these systems. Uh, 
the animals benefit from hetero heterogeneity. Um, so I think management would be another thing to, to pursue, to, to know how to manage these systems to increase the amount of forage these animals are, are, are ingesting per unit of time. Mm -hmm. So that this animal, the, the, the animals doesn't need to, to, to walk all day long trying to, 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 to meet their demand. Uh, so I think, I think that's it. Mm. I think that's it. So, um, Overcoming barriers and using uh, best management practices. Yeah, and this includes uh, adjusted stocking rates, uh, moderate grazing intensities, um, fertilization, as I said before. varieties. Because I'm different varieties. Mm -hmm. And of course, other things, but I, I think they are not the main barriers. Of course, good genetics. Uh, mm -hmm. Reproductive is, efficiency, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this is all important, of course, but uh, I think the, 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 the things that are lacking uh, is to overcome these barriers and, and focus on management and, and understanding how to, to improve the efficiency through management mm -hmm. in in your part of of your country is there we have um a phase of the cattle life cycle that's called stalker phase mm -hmm. so after weaning but before they go into a finishing operation so maybe they're in the you know 500 pound whatever range and we want to put a couple hundred pounds on them and a lot of those animals will end up on annual ryegrass clover pasture. Mm -hmm. And and so cow-calf operation tends to be a low return operation. Um, and but stalker can be more prof. Is is that a practice that you see in your part of Brazil where people are bringing in those weaned animals to run them for a time but not necessarily be in the cow calf business yeah this happens a lot um what what usually happens is that farms like uh my family farm for instance which are mainly composed by 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 native grasslands or they're let's say specialized livestock farms they are the, the, the places where these cow-calf operations are, are happening and they are usually providing uh, part of the animals are finished in, 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 this, in this system and part of the animals are, are exported or are, are, are sold to, to, other, to other farmers or ranchers who are, for, for example, starting to integrate. Uh, so they just uh, finish the, the animals in the winter phase of a crop pasture system, for instance. This is what, what happens. But this, this happens a lot. This happens a lot. Especially in, in more traditional, in the north of, of the state, uh, the more traditional crop cropping systems are there. And in the south of the state, the more traditional livestock uh, systems are, are here. So th there is this, 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 trans this, Transitions, uh, yeah. Trans yeah. Transition zone, yeah. yeah. The animals from the south going to the north to be finished. This happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Pedro, thank you so much. Um, I'm aware of the hassle that you went through to, to be here today, and I really, really appreciate it. And I'm also aware of the sacrifice you're making because it's summer there. And you're not <laughs> running the air conditioner, so that um, I don't want to force you to. to uh, but it's it's only fair. I've asked you a lot of questions, and you've been very gracious with the answers. Is are there questions you'd like to ask me? Not actually, Peter. Uh, I just want to thank you for for again for inviting me here. Uh, I I hope our connection is is good enough. Uh, I try to be in a bad in a better connection at the university but something happened and every and it didn't work so i needed to come back home and and but i think it worked i think it worked thank you again for inviting me i hope uh, uh i i i i could help with this initiative 
And I hope people understand my my English. I'm not practicing my English as as much as I would want to. I'm 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 writing a lot during this pandemic pandemic time, but I'm not practicing my my spoken English. So so maybe it's not the best English, but but I hope it was good enough. It was more than good enough, far better than my Portuguese. And um, maybe <laughs> maybe we can just arrange some practice sessions where we just talk to each other uh, in yeah. the days to come. This thank would be you. great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.